begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're in the back, Acts of the Apostles. We're looking at chapter 9, Acts chapter 9. You'll notice the study sheet says Acts 9 and 10. Pastor Henning and I talked this over and we thought there's too much material for one hour. So we are going to go down to the end of number four. No, wait a minute. Somebody has one with a little yellow marker on it, a yellow, gold marker on it? No. What did I do with that one? thought I was maybe in the list. Okay, it doesn't matter. We're going to deal with the Apostle Paul today. And it starts with him being named Saul. When you get to chapter 19, Barnabas and Saul are set apart to be missionaries to Asia Minor. And then it says, Paul, or Saul, who's also known as Paul. And from Acts chapter 13, he's Paul. In our lesson for today, he's still Saul. He's still that Pharisee named Saul. Where does that Old Testament Saul name come from? The first king of Israel. First king of his, who is a head and shoulders taller than anybody else. And when they first wanted to call him, he did not think of himself higher than he ought to think. He was hiding among the luggage, the baggage, when they're trying to find him to anoint him king. Saul, by his own words, says he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was the top line of the Israelites. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee trained by Gamaliel. And he was fierce defending the laws of Moses. He said if there's anybody who could have been saved by keeping the law, he would have been. That's when he thought of himself more highly than he ought to think. What did he write to the Romans? Don't do that. In our lesson today, we're going to find the self-righteous, arrogant Saul, Pharisee, brought low. Now, in our lesson today, I feel it's going to be easier to take the story with my reading it so that it will be online. And if it's online, through the microphone, then they can follow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read make some comments, and you ask me questions. And I am not paying much attention to the guidelines, so if you need the blank filled in, you got to do that yourself. <laughs> and if you can't figure out how to fill in the blank, raise your hand, ask me, and I'll find somebody that somebody's got the answer, okay? I don't claim to have the answers today. All I claim is, the conversion of Saul on his way to Damascus is a powerful story of the power of the gospel. If there was an enemy of the Christian church, it was Saul. Look how it starts chapter 9. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem, throw them in jail. Why does it say that Saul was still breathing murderous threats? What did we know about Saul before this? He was actually an official in the stoning of Stephen. That's why those that stoned him laid their outer robes, that, that big robe that covered them. You can't throw stones very well when you're wearing an overcoat, you know. How, how, did, how, did, how did we ever fight the Second World War during winter in Germany? All these big heavy coats on, how could you ever even aim a gun? Oh, I, what does that, oh that's not in the lesson today. He is going to find those of the way 
Who are the people of the way? Okay, where, where, where did the church get the name the way? Jesus said that of himself, didn't he? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, what is his intention in going to Damascus? Where is he going first in Damascus? Why the synagogue? He's looking for Christians. Isn't that where they gathered first? Whenever Paul goes into a new town, he goes to the synagogue. Until he's thrown out. <laughs> but why? Because that's where people knew the Old Testament prophecies. And Paul was his education under Gamaliel. Gamaliel was the most famous university professor in Jerusalem. So he knew the book of Moses, or the five books of Moses, the Torah. And he was able to point out how Jesus, born in Bethlehem, of the line of David, was the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. You're going to find several times in your translations that Christ is translated into English as Messiah. Now why would you take the Greek word Christ, which we know for Jesus, and in the New Testament call him the Messiah? I, I, I think I told this to my class on Friday. It's not good translating if you're translating Greek for English speakers to translate the word into Hebrew. And that's what they do. If you happen to have a Bible translation and I don't think the NIV does it, but sometimes our own EHV does it, refers in the New Testament to Christ as the Messiah. He's the Christ. Now, put it in brackets if you want that he's the Messiah, because that's what Christ means, the anointed one. So here's Paul going to Damascus with letters of authority. That kind of suggests that he's an officer of the church, isn't he? He's being authorized by the Sanhedrin to get rid of those Christians. He's eager to do that. He happens to be a Roman citizen with two names. The Hebrew people, if they called a child Yeshua, in Greek he'd be known as Jesus. If they named their son Saul after a king, they'd give him a Roman name, Paul. The Roman name is actually Paulus. Paulus. Because the Latin uh, for a male has a U-S ending. If it's a girl, there's a Paula. That's Paula was a woman with the name Paul. Except, you know in English? We call her Paula. But if there's a Paul here, we don't call him Paulus. We call him Paul. See, sometimes, sometimes we treat women so much nicer than we treat men. <laughs> Verse 3. As Saul journeyed, he came near Damascus. Now, Damascus is in Syria. Syria is the country just north of Israel. <coughs> And actually, it's in the news a lot. A lot of the refugees uh, from Hamas went up to Syria to get away from the Israelites and their war. So that area of the country is still pretty well known. And Damascus at that time was the capital city of, of uh, Syria. And remember when Jesus said, when you see the signs of the end of the world, Get out of town. And when the persecution was going on under the Apostle Paul, under Saul, sorry, I almost made a mistake there. When Saul was persecuting the people in Jerusalem, we read that people fled from the city and took the gospel everywhere they went. And many of those obviously went to Damascus, the next major city where they could feel safe. Part of the Roman Empire. 
He comes near Damascus. Suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Do you ever notice when Jesus is very concerned with someone? Martha, Martha, why did you worry? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks. Right? He is showing his loving concern for Saul who's persecuting him. Why are you persecuting me? Now, the Latin Bible, the Vulgate, very common in the Roman Catholic and, and the Greek Orthodox churches, goes on to say, it is hard for you to kick against the pricks. My King James Bible back then had that sentence. Do any of you have the Bible that says it's hard to kick against the pricks? That's a goad. You know, if you wanted that donkey to move, you had this long stick with sharp points. Choo, choo, choo. My pastor Zimmerman said that was, that was sort of like a, a wheat, a head of wheat. Do we know how it sticks out like that? Now, you may want to try this. I did this when I was in seventh grade catechism class. If you take a head of wheat or some of these wild uh, things that grow on the side of the road and you put them inside your pants and you walk, it creeps up. Do you know that? You ever try that? There's something for you to do this week. <laughs> what I found out also, you know that Hoya is called jumping cactus? Jumping cactus does not jump, but it is so sharp with little barbs that if you just touch it, it's going to... And you know what else it does? The longer it's in there, those barbs work their way forward. You get, a, you get one of those things in your arm, pull it out no matter how badly it hurts. Because it's going to just keep working its way deeper. And it's so sharp, it can go way in there where they do have to do surgery to remove a koya, uh, jumping cactus. Well, I learned... Jesus said, Saul, you can't kick against those goads. And that always reminded me, the first year we came to Arizona, we were out at Papago Park. Any of you been in Phoenix? You know where Papago Park is? What are these great big cactus that kind of look like people? We call them people cactus. Saguaro. Oh, okay, thank you. Here's my big brother. He's got heavy shoes on, so he goes up and he's going to kick that swarrow over. <laughs> His foot got stuck. <laughs> His shoe stuck to the barbs of that cactus. And I just always remember that. Yeah, Lyndon, you should not try to kick against the pricks. It's just like Jesus told Saul. Didn't you learn from Saul? Don't kick against the pricks or against the goads. He had to take his shoe off. Before he could work his... Anyway. <laughs> you see why we're only going to get through half of the lesson today? <laughs> None of you have that line in your Bibles, do you? I have it down below that says, Some texts omit that sentence. I studied it in the Greek Bible, and there are a whole bunch of what they call later manuscripts that include it. And all of the Latin manuscripts include it. But the old, oldest of the Greek manuscripts do not have, you cannot kick against the pricks. So most of our translations don't have that. So now I just spent about five minutes on a verse that we don't have in the Bible because I think the Latin people thought that fit. And so the Latin copyist, writing by hand, put it in there. And then Jerome, when he translated the Vulgate, he included that sentence. And it's a good sentence. It just doesn't seem like Luke had that idea when he did this. So Saul said, Who are you, Lord? 
I mean, the bright light from heaven. What's going on up there? Saul, Saul, who are you? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. You persecute my people, you're persecuting me. Jesus told his disciples, if you confess me before men, I will confess you. He said, when they persecute you, remember they persecuted me first. So Jesus' people, I should say it the other way around, Jesus feels this closeness to his people. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Why would Saul, confronted by a bright, bright light from heaven, realize that if it's the Lord, there's something for me to do? Saul knew the Old Testament. He knew the bright light that would shine on the tabernacle. He would know the bright light was the glory of the Lord. Now he's struck down to the ground by this bright light and the voice. He's blind. We're told that a little bit later, that he had to be helped up even. He's blind. Lord, what do you want me to do? And so when I preach a sermon today, that you should present your bodies as living sacrifices acceptable to the Lord, you should ask me, what should I do? And I told you, if your gift is teaching, teach. If your gift is encouraging, encourage. If your gift is leading, lead. If your gift is contributing, contribute generous. If you can show mercy and smile and help somebody out of a dark, gloomy time, do it. So, you just had your own Saul experience, and you're not even close to Damascus. So the Lord said, here's what I want you to do. He did not say, be my ambassador to the nations. He said, no. Arise, go into the city. You will be told what to do. Right? So, and the men who journeyed with him stood speechless. Hearing a voice, now they heard the voice, it doesn't say they heard the words. They don't know that this is Jesus necessarily. But all of these people were probably Pharisees. They were probably part of Saul's group. They knew the Bible. They knew sometimes a voice came from heaven. I wonder if they knew that the voice came to heaven at Jesus' baptism and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. So a voice from heaven is not unusual in the Holy Scriptures. Sometimes the voice comes in a dream. Joseph was told in a dream, take Mary to be your wife. The child which is conceived of her is of the Holy Spirit. And you will name him Jesus. That was in a dream. I've had dreams that seem very, very, very real and I have to really think about it before it's telling me or showing me to do something. You probably have had some pretty real dreams yourself. I, I'm not going to take any lessons. Don't, don't tell me your stories. The men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. They must have seen the bright light. And when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand. <laughs> Can't you just... <laughs> Here's this Saul, this great Pharisee, the official authorized by the Sanhedrin. And they got to take him by hand and lead him. Humiliated? Yeah. Yeah. Paul never thought of himself more highly than he ought to think the rest of his life. What did he call himself? Chief of sinners. I persecuted the church. He was three days without sight 
and neither ate nor drank. I can go three days without a eating. I've done it with the flu. But I want water. I want water. What does this tell us about Saul? I'm sure they, they brought the canteen and said, drink. They probably put figs and, and, and apples in front of them and said, eat. What's that tell you about Saul? I, I, I would just say, this was a terrifying experience. It was a deep spiritual emotion. So he is ready when he sees in a vision that a man named Ananias, Ananias, hey, you just heard about Ananias. What did you just hear about Ananias? He fell down dead and they carried him out and buried him, right? He lied about what he brought into the church. He lied and he died. Here's a good Ananias. He is a believer in Damascus. Never heard of him before. This is the only event that is recorded in his life. So the Lord said, Arise and go to the street called Straight. What is the main city, what is the main street in downtown Phoenix? Central. Central. What is the main street in downtown Prescott? Gurley ah, Street. Or Montezuma, whichever way you want to go. Why would they have called this street straight? You could not have a straight street in Prescott, right? There is, well, okay, Gurley is kind of straight, isn't it? But look, look around, especially if you go up to Hope and up on the streets. That's the way it was in Damascus. Damascus was a Roman-developed city. They had one street right through town. And the Romans had great festivals, they had parades. Straight Street was the best known place in town. And the others were just all crooked, running off of here. So here's Saul. He doesn't even have to ask where the, where the, the uh, synagogue was. That's, he was headed for the synagogue. No, you go to Straight Street. You ask for Simon the Tanner. Simon's a familiar name in the Old Testament, right? Simeon, he was the second oldest child of, uh, of Jacob. So Simeon's a tanner. And there is an apostle of Jesus who is also known as Simon that was called Rocky. Can you say Rocky in Greece, Greek? Peter. Peter is simply Rocky in Greek. I've yet to find a Bible that calls him, calls him that. Okay, go to Straight Street and see Ananias who is staying there with Simon. Verse 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many people about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And by the way, do any of your translations use the word saints? Saints in Jerusalem? Do you do have saints, or does it have believers? It does have saints, okay. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. You want me to go, Saul, here I am, tie me up, take me to jail? I mean, is that in Simon and Ananias' mind? Could very well be, right? Ah, it doesn't look like a good idea to go out and meet the police who have a search warrant to arrest me. The Lord said, do it. The Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to hear my name, to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings and the children of Israel. 
Here's something new. Didn't you always call the Apostle Paul the missionary to the Gentiles? Here he's called to be a missionary to the children of Israel. So that might be right in line why, why he would go out to a new city and go to the synagogue. He'd go to the children of Israel. And as he proclaimed to the children of Israel and they rejected the gospel, he went to the Gentiles. And he said that. Sometimes he would kick the dust off his feet and say, then I'm turning to the Gentiles. So Paul was aware of the fact that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All need to be justified by grace through faith. Paul, Paul's ministry is all focused in that. But let me get back to Saul. I will show him how many things he must suffer for my namesake. What's Saul been doing? He's been making the believers suffer. He's thrown them in jail. He helped stone Stephen. Saul, it's payback. You have been persecuting my church, and now you are going to take up my name, and for my name's sake, you will be persecuted. Read 1 Corinthians, I think it's 1 Corinthians 11 or 12, all the things he suffered. Twice he was stoned and left for dead. Shipwrecked, spent a night in the sea, cast out of cities, cast out of synagogues. He's going to suffer because he takes up the name Jesus. Now many times when you hear the gospel reading, Jesus says to you, if you follow me, you will have to take up a cross. You will have to bear the cross that they have thrown on me. If I have suffered, you will suffer. See how the world has changed under the power of the Holy Spirit? There are enough Christians in the United States today, there's nobody at the door trying to arrest us and throw us in prison. Thank the Lord for that. There are countries where the people are out there trying to find the Christians. Not only throw them in jail, but to execute them. Christians today, you may not know this, there have been more Christian martyrs in the 20th century than in the 19 centuries that preceded it. 1900 years, martyrs all over the world. But just in the 1900s, the 20th century, more Christians have been put to death. Uh, there is a magazine called The Voice of the Martyrs. Any of you ever come across that magazine? The Voice of the Martyrs. And it is a very well documented uh, how Christians suffer today. Yeah, I kind of thought so. Okay, moving on. Ananias went his way and entered the house. Laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, brother! Ananias is calling him a fellow saint, a fellow believer. Why? Because Jesus sent him to him with work to do for Jesus. And the only people who serve Jesus are believers. You cannot serve Jesus apart from faith. You cannot do a good work apart from faith. And faith always works. And like Ananias does what Jesus tells us to do. My chosen vessel. Okay, Ananias went, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, and some Bible passages actually include Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do any of you have a translation that has Christ in there? Okay, it's a fairly common in some of the Greek manuscripts. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. Brother Saul, the Lord sent the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came. 
has sent to me that you may receive your sight. See, that's probably the first thing that Saul was worried about. He can't see. You will receive your sight. But you'll also be appointed a missionary to the world. You will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. And by the way, Luke knew Paul very well, traveled with him on his missionary journeys. How many times did, did Saul sit around in the evening over a glass of wine? They'd had a little bit of unleavened bread to go with it. And, and he said, you know, I was blind for three days. All of a sudden it just seemed like scales, like those fish scales fell off of my eyes. So Luke is giving us very much a first-hand report of the missionary Paul's work. But he's still Saul. Okay? He's still Saul. Let's see what he still does as a believing Saul. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. And in his baptism he received the Holy Spirit. Because baptism is a washing of the Holy Spirit. So now he was looking to Jesus to take his scales off his eyes. And he receives Jesus who washes his sins away and is filled with the Holy Spirit. Now he can do what Peter did. He can preach the gospel with the power of the Holy Spirit behind him. So then, so when he received food, he was strengthened. Actually, the Greek said he got stronger or he strength, was strengthening himself. This is a secret. But often on Sunday morning or on a day that I'm going to play ball, after I finish my Cheerios, I drink a little glass of Boost. I get the very vanilla. I don't know what kind you got. The strawberry one didn't taste good. Very vanilla. It's just like a milkshake. So this morning I had Boost. Does it look like a... Ananias went his way and entered, I'm sorry, laying his hands on him was also a sign of authority, authorizing. Pastor Zimmerman not only confirmed me, he laid hands on my head when I was ordained. So I was authorized. So if I stand here as your pastor, I am not thinking of myself more highly than I ought to think. But like Paul, I know better than he does that I am chief of sinners. I can't compare myself to anybody else because I know what I am, chief of sinners. Saul spent some days with the disciples in Damascus. I wonder if it was hard to get into that group. Or if Ananias simply took him, like Barnabas does later, and said, here's Paul. Here's Paul. You thought of him as Saul, but here's Paul. And from then on, you know, he uses his Greek or his Latin name because he's going into the Greek world. There is a break at verse 20. Do you have started a new paragraph or even a, a new title? I have a title, Saul Preaches Christ. And if you would step back a couple of weeks when you saw Saul participating in stoning of Stephen, because when Stephen says, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Receive me, O Lord. Saul, the Pharisee that he was, was filled with anger. And it doesn't say this in the Bible, but I think those throwing stones threw it all the harder. Once he said, I see the Son of Man, they stoned him harder. And he prayed, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. I wonder if Paul, I wonder if Saul at this point has those words echoing 
Lord, lay not this sin to his charge. Paul knew he was saved by grace. He did not need it. More than half of the times grace is used in the Bible, it's in one of the letters of Paul. By grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works. Paul knew grace. He preached Christ in the synagogue. <laughs> when Jesus preached the Messiah in Nazareth, in the synagogue, what did the people of Nazareth do? When he said, now these words are fulfilled in your... Throw him down the cliff. Throw him over the hill. Throw him off the hill. Kill him. And Jesus said, well, a prophet is not received in his own hometown. What did he preach? Christ is the Son of God. He heard Stephen say, I see the Son of Man. Saul already realizes the Old Testament angel of the Lord, the second person of the Trinity, the prophesied Messiah, is God. He's called the Son of God. How can any church like the Seventh-day Adventists and the Jehovah's Witnesses deny that Jesus was God? Yeah. Yeah. When it's... When it's... It's right there. <laughs> they what? I, I think I misspoke myself. Caught me. I admit it, it's the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and, of course, Islam that denies that Jesus... Well, there's a real Jesus. Take forward in Christ home with you today. They hand it out at the door, right? There is an article in there by the pastor that I served under in Las Vegas, Pastor Matt Vogt. He is now... In fact, he took a call to be mission counselor... And I became the vacancy pastor at uh, Water of Life in, Ho in, uh, not Hope, in Las Vegas. He said, statistics have taken that the unchurched people in the United States have an 86% favorable thinking of Jesus Christ. People think positively Jesus was at least a good man. And he said that same survey says... 11% have favorable view of the Christian church. He said, here's an idea of how to witness. Tell people about Jesus. Don't tell them. We've got a church down there on North 2nd Avenue North or whatever. <laughs> what do you call these things? If they'd call it Straight Street, I could remember it. <laughs> In other words, and this is a mistake I've often made. I would go door to door and say, I'm from Redeemer Lutheran Church. I'm the new pastor here now. I want to tell you about Jesus. No, much better off. Do you know about Jesus, the Savior of the world? And then people might want to know what you think of Jesus. You don't have to tell them, oh, we got a pastor wagon collect. You got to come here, pastor wagon collect. He gets that excited. Don't do that. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in, Jesus, in Jerusalem? And has come here for that same purpose, so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests in Jerusalem. But Saul increased all the more in strength. The Holy Spirit's in him. He confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, went to the synagogue, proving that Jesus is Christ. I have done a number of Bible classes taking Old Testament prophecies and say, look at the fulfillment in Christ. Now, if he was talking to Jews who knew the Torah, 
If he was talking to people like the Pharisees who knew the Bible, if he was talking to the scribes who wrote the Bible, he could prove from Old Testament prophecy that's Jesus. A baby born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, of the line of David. See, I can, I can just hear Saul preaching Christ. I uh, better move along and get his, his story finished, and then we can go to Peter next week. Now, after many days were passed, many days were passed, months, weeks, a year. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. That's the first time Paul gets labeled that way. But their plot... Their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night. The enemies are watching the gate. We're going to get him when he leaves. Don't let him out the door. We're going to get him. So, the disciples, other believers, and by the way, disciples is all the believers, not just 12. Disciples is you and me. Jesus said, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations. You and I are disciples. The disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall in a large basket. Kind of reminds me of Jericho where the spies were let out of a window down the wall and got away. And then later on, of course, Rahab and her family were able to come out the window and were spared. We even have the details Paul says, and I was sitting in this little basket as they lowered me by rope. See, Luke has the little details of Paul's life. Any questions up to here? Now what's going to happen to the believing, the believing Saul? What's this change going to be? When Saul had come to Jerusalem... Saul later on writes that when he was escaped from Damascus, he went into Arabia. And at the time, there was a city called Petra. And you can Google that if you want, because way out there in the desert was a big, beautiful town. Many people think when people fled from the Romans in Jerusalem, they went out into the wilderness and built their town of Petra. Petra. Oh, Peter. Oh, they named their town after Peter. It was a group of believers. And it seems as if Paul, it seems as if Saul went out into the desert. And there he continued to study and to learn from other believers that Jesus is the Christ, who had appeared to him on the road. So now he's going to go to Jerusalem. You think he's going to be welcomed? <laughs> hey, welcome back. Hey, welcome back. You're going to let those guys out of jail now? After many days were passed, the Jews... Oops, I did that. 26. 26. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. But they were all afraid of him. Later on, he writes that he only saw two of the apostles. And that was Peter and James, the brother of Jesus. Not the apostle James, but the James that wrote the book of James. But Barnabas, good old Barnabas, he's the encourager. He was a believing Jew from the island of Cyprus, right out there in the Mediterranean. Now he's in Jerusalem. He mingles with all of the apostles and disciples. And he understands Paul's story. And he's on Paul's side. Don't call him Saul anymore. He's Paul. Of course when they called him finally to be a missionary. They called him Paul. Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road. And that he had spoken to him 
And how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Jesus had said at one time, no one who speaks my name in public could be against me. And I'm sure the 12 disciples remembered that. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. And he writes to the Corinthians, and I didn't go to Jerusalem to learn from the apostles. He says, I learned from the Holy Scriptures by the Holy Spirit. Paul based his faith even in the resurrection of Jesus on the fact that the Holy Spirit convinced him of these things. He spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, the Greeks. See, and these were probably Jewish Greeks. You know, they went to Greek and they came back as Greeks and, and they worshipped at the, tab, at, the, at the temple but they were Greek citizens with Judean blood. And they defended Moses. And most likely didn't quote the Hebrew. They probably quoted the Septuagint, which was the Old Testament, Greek uh, Old Testament. They attempted to kill him. Well, there's number two. When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea, Caesarea is a Roman city, Roman city built to honor Tiberius Caesar. The Jewish people wanted to please Caesar, and so they built a city and named it Caesar. I think that's where Tel Aviv is today. It's on the water, and they shipped him to Tarsus. Any of you know why they would have shipped him up to the northern part of the Mediterranean Sea, to Asia Minor. Why send him to Tarsus? <laughs> I think I heard it. What? Nobody knew him there. Ah, okay. You're wrong, though. Everybody knew him there. That's where he came from. There was his hometown. Several times he is called Saul of Tarsus. So they sent him to Tarsus. And this is as far as we're going to go because we're going to change gears and we're going to study about Peter who is working with all these Judeans, all these Jews and he doesn't want to handle anybody that's a Gentile. How does God get a Pharisee to preach to the Gentiles? He converts them. How does he get his own disciple who doesn't like Samaritans and doesn't like Greeks, doesn't like Gentiles and Romans, to go visit a Roman and to go into his house and ask a Roman to come eat dinner with him. You will find that out next week, <laughs> unless you read ahead. It's not a bad idea to read ahead chapter 10 in the Acts of the Apostles. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.